You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. We are in middle of learning about the laws of proper speech. It is so important to ensure that every word that comes out of our mouth is appropriate. We shouldn't be talking about other people. We shouldn't be, because usually what happens when we talk about other people, we end up saying something that perhaps is compromising or negative about the other person. So there's an amazing piece of Talmud in Tractate Sota 42a. Rabbi Yirmiya Bar Abba said, Arba kitos ein mikablos pneishchino. There are four classes of sinners that do not merit to receive the divine presence. Who are those four categories of people? Kasle tzanim, those who are the class of scoffers. Kas chanafim, class of flatterers. Vikas shkarim, the class of liars. Vikas misapre lashon hara. And the fourth one is the class of those who speak lashon hara. And Rabbi Yirmiyah now brings scriptural support for each of these. Now, we have to understand that any time, just a reminder for those of you who are frequenting on our Thinking Talmudist podcast, what's the purpose of our class on Friday afternoons where we study Talmud? Exactly what he is doing right now, Rav Yirmiya, where he's making a bold statement, you have to back it up. In Judaism, everything needs to be sourced. You cannot teach a word of Torah because it feels good, because it sounds right. It's got to be sourced. Everything is about the truth. So Rav Yirmiya now is going to bring his source. Coslates and the class of scoffers do not merit to receive the divine presence, because it says in Hosea, he withdrew his hand from scoffers, referring to the Almighty. Mashach yada HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mehiyos Es Lotzitzim, that the words he withdrew, his hand refers to the Holy One, the Almighty, who withdraws from association with scoffers. Hashem doesn't want to have anything to do with those who mock others. Late night shows, for example. Uh, They have no right to pick a victim and neuter them because they have to sell tickets and they have to have ratings of mockery and laughing at other people. Kascha Nafim, the class of flatterers, what's the backup for that? He says, In Job, it says, For before him no flatterer shall come. That's referring to the Almighty. That no flatterer should come. What is a flatterer? So we think of flattery as someone who flatters someone. Oh, you have such a nice dress, you have such a nice shirt, and they're flattering them. What it really means is, what the Talmud refers to it as, is echad bepeve echad belev. Someone who really, in their heart, feels one way, but with their mouth, thinks another way. Meaning, I hate this person so much, but I'm going to smile to them. And behind their back, I'm going to do everything disgusting I can to make it clear that I don't like that person, and I'm going to fake it to them. That's, or, or by the way, if you have someone that you feel that if you lie to them, you will benefit from them. People who can say negative things about uh, a donor, for example, someone who donates to an organization and they can say nasty things about them, God forbid, but you know what, I'll swallow it to get their donation. It's not appropriate. I've seen this happen in synagogues where synagogues really don't like certain personalities, but they'll tolerate them for their money. And that's a type, a form of flattery that the Torah says is not being truthful. The third category is kashkarim, the class of liars that do not merit to receive the divine presence. Dechsev dover shkarim lo yikon leneged enai. One who tells lies shall not establish before my, not be established before my eyes. Referring again to the eyes of Hashem, that one who is speaking falsehood cannot be in the presence of Hashem. And then the final one, the one that relates to us here, 
is kas misapre lashonara. The class of those who speak lashonara does not merit to receive the divine presence because it says in Psalms chapter 5, verse 5, for you are not a God who desires wickedness. Evil cannot abide with you. God doesn't want anything to do with someone who speaks slander, who talks negatively about other people. Rashi explains the word yagurcha, yagurcha ra, thus lo yogur imcha ra. Evil cannot abide together with you, Hashem. And with regards to those who speak Lashon Hara, it is written in the passage, Ki ein befihu nechona, for there is no sincerity in their lips. The verse th- can thus be paraphrased, You, Hashem, are righteous, therefore evil cannot dwell in your abode. So I want to share with you something which is not written here in, in the notes, but it's something we've talked about a while back. If you take the name of Hashem, Yud and He and Vav and He. It's the name of Hashem. And there are 72 different forms of the names of Hashem. And our sages tell us that the world was created with the combination of the letters of God's name. So the name of Hashem is very powerful. And we have to understand that when you have these four letters of Hashem's name, they all represent something. For example, what is the Yud? The Yud is the first letter of God's name, and the Yud is also the smallest letter in the alphabet. Why? Because Yud is the only letter that cannot be split in half. If you take an Aleph, for example, if you can just picture the letter Aleph in your mind, the Aleph has three letters. It has a Yud on top, it has a Vav diagonally across, and a Yud on the bottom. Yud Yud, and a vav in the middle. That is, a yud is 10 in numerology in, with the Hebrew letters, and vav is 6. So yud, yud, it's 26. 26 is the name of Hashem. So just in the letter Aleph, you have the name of Hashem. But that's just an example of how you can take one letter, the letter Aleph, and it becomes three different letters. It also tells us the letter Aleph comes from the word aluf, which means master. And if you look at the yud that's on the right side of the aleph, it has a finger pointing up. That's the way it's written. If you look in any Torah, it's telling us aluf, there's a master of the universe. It's pointing up, saying Hashem is the master of the universe. So what is the what do you do with the letter Vav? Vav can be split in half. It can make two yuds. But Yud cannot be split in half. Yud is just one, which teaches us Hashem Echad. Hashem is one. When we say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hashem is one. It's referring that Hashem is indivisible. Hashem cannot be split into pieces, into parts. Hashem has no partners. Hashem is one and only one. Echad Yachidum Yuchad. One and only one. What is someone who's a flatterer? They're two-faced. They're two-faced. They can't reside where God is because God is all about one, oneness. We say, Hashem Elokechem Emet. God is truth. Hashem created the world with a He. It says, Behi Baram. This is in Genesis. Behi Baram. Hashem created the world with a He. If you imagine again in your mind how the letter He looks, there's this hollow space in the middle. You have the like a Dalit on the side, and then you have a little Yud, right? And then you have this space in the middle. Say just tells us that God created the world with the letter He. He means that everything that God, the manufacturer of this world, created, he created for a purpose. Why the letter He? Say, just tell us, because God cre- embedded into creation forgiveness. That if someone falls into that abyss, they can always come back and start over again. They fall, they can come back. And that's the cycle of life that God embedded into creation. But that Hashem created everything. We recently said in a previous podcast 
There is nothing that Hashem created that is extra. You open up the hood of a car and you see, oh, there's just this extra pipe, there's extra wire, let's just cut it out. Right? Something's not going to work right. The same thing is with every creation. Every creation is there for a reason. Hashem thought that the world cannot exist without Mark today. And therefore, Mark is going to be here today. And someone who mocks Mark is saying he's worthless. And therefore, it's a contradiction to Hashem's letter, hey, that creates everything for a purpose. The letter Vav, Vav is the letter of connection. The only way for something to exist is with truth. Falsehood has existence, but falsehood doesn't last forever. It'll eventually fall. If we look at the letters of emet, which is truth, all the letters, the aleph, the mem, and the taf, all have two, two legs. But if you look at the, at the letters that comprise the word sheker, which is falsehood, lies, they all have one leg. The shin comes to a point, the resh has one leg, and the kuf comes to a point as well because one leg will eventually fall. You can stand a little bit on one leg, but eventually you'll lose your balance. You can't stand forever on one leg. What the letter Vav is telling us is that God sustains this world. The only way to sustain this world is with truth. Like we mentioned previously, Hashem, Elokechem, Emet. Hashem, our God, is all about truth. It's all about truth. And that kicks out the group of those who speak falsehood because they can't exist in God's world. And then we have the the fourth letter of Hashem's name is the letter He, the second He. In the Yud, the He, and the Vav, and now the, the second He. The second He is that Hashem recreates the world constantly. Hashem recreates the world constantly. And that recreation means that there's a purpose. When someone speaks Lashon Hara, they're saying that this per- person has no purpose. They're ridiculing the person's worth. We don't need him. He's just extra. Or we don't value him, which is why we talk negatively about them. And our sages tell us on a deeper level that what someone is doing when he's one of these classes of categories of people, what they're doing is they themselves are contradicting God. And therefore, they're pushing away God's presence. It's very important for us to know that we all have a relationship with God that must be developed. We develop it through prayer. We develop it through study through Torah study, and we need to find a way to bring godliness into our lives. And when we do certain things, what we're doing is we're pushing God away. We mentioned this morning that mitzvot asay, the performative mitzvot in the Torah, which there are 248 of them in the Torah, they are tools to bring us closer to God. Mitzvot lot say prohibitions in the Torah, which there are 365 of them, are to protect us from falling and distancing ourselves from God. The mitzvot say the performative is to bring us closer to God, and the prohibitions is to protect us from falling and distancing ourselves from Hashem. And when, and by the way, they correspond to the limbs of our body. They correspond to the sinews of our body. We need to realize that Hashem wants a closeness with us. Hashem doesn't need our prayers. Hashem loves our prayers. Hashem doesn't need our mitzvahs. He loves our mitzvahs because what Hashem wants more than anything is a relationship with his creations. Hashem longs, yearns for that closeness with us. We, in turn, we will see that uh, King David, what did King David say? Kirvas Elokim Litov, the closeness with Hashem, is what I yearn for, is what I want. All I want is being close to God. That's it I want. 
very interesting that we say, Hashem ro'i lo echsar. In the verse in, in Psalms where King David says, God is my shepherd, I will not, I will not be missing out. Hashem will take care of me. I don't know if I said this recently, but I walked into my kitchen one morning and I try to give my wife a little break. So I say, you, you just go to sleep. I'll take care of the kids. I'll get them out. I'll prepare the lunches, their snacks, give them breakfast and, and uh, get them off to school. So I usually do a couple of runs to school because they have the older kids. They need to be there at, some, at a certain time. Then the younger ones need to be at a different time. So we have our little baby, our little uh, eight-month-old, and I sit her in her high chair, and I give her her little puffs that she eats, and uh, she loves them. So I put her in. I give her her puffs. I get the first first carpool into the car. I run them to school, come back. The second, second shift is almost ready. They're almost finished their breakfast, and I walk into the kitchen, and I see my little baby daughter, eight months old, her tray is empty. She finished her entire tray. And she's the happiest little thing ever. But she has no more. She has no more little puffs on her tray. And she's not concerned. She doesn't have a panic attack, no anxiety, no worry. You know why? Because for all she knows, Hashem ro'i lo achsar. Hashem is my shepherd, and I won't be lacking anything. Who's her Hashem at this moment? Her parents. She knows that I'm coming home, and I'm going to be right back there putting those more puffs on her tray. And it dawned on me, how many times did we get worried? (gasps) How am I going to pay rent next month? How am I going to pay my mortgage? I have that insurance bill coming. It's due. What am I going to do? Guess what? We need to be like that little eight-month-old child who doesn't have a care in the world because she knows her father's coming and he's going to take care of it. Hashem is our father who's exactly the same position where he's going to take care of us. He's not in the same position because he's capable of doing anything in the world. I just have a few puffs that I can put on her tray. Hashem can do anything how much more so we should feel that closeness with Hashem. We should feel that confidence. Hashem is right there to take care of us. Now, going back to what we're talking about, speaking, using the power to communicate in a proper way, Allah now continues. Our sages of blessed memory said in Sanhedrin, call Leitzanusa Asira. All mockery is forbidden. Bar except for mockery of idol worship. Dichsiv, as it says, and he brings a verse, and it was at noontime Eliyahu ridiculed the prophets of Baal. That type of mockery is permitted. So we see that laughing at other people is not a good thing. I don't know who gives newspapers. TV hosts, late night comedy hosts, who gives them the right to laugh at other people? You know, they, they have all of these things that you have to sign a, a waiver. You know, if someone gets you on television, you have to sign a waiver that you agree and that you are okay with being present on television. Usually they do that when they do these, um, these, uh, gotcha, uh, videos. You know, what are those, uh, videos called? Candid cameras. Right, so the, uh, eventually you need to sign that you actually agree. Why? Because it could be demeaning, it could be hurtful. But the truth is that any time we talk about someone, we should have them sign a waiver and say, you know, I spoke about you. I wanted to make sure that you're okay. That I spoke. W- what did you say about me? Right, that wouldn't work too well. That wouldn't work too well. And it's it's really sad that. This is the reality. The reality of the world is that we talk and talk and talk, and it's hurtful. It's hurtful when you talk about other people. The Allah that we learned last week says that the one who accepts the Lashon Hara 
is just as bad, if not worse, than the person who speaks the Lashon Hara. Why? Because your silence encourages them to continue to speak. So there is an old torch video that you can find online, someplace on YouTube. Why did God create earlobes? There's no medical reason for earlobes except to be there available for earrings. There's really no reason for earlobes except our commentaries say that Hashem created earlobes so that we can put them into our ear when someone speaks Lashon Hara and we can close our ears so that we don't hear it. That's how important it is. Now, we also mentioned last week that we have two eyes, we have two ears, we have two nostrils, and one mouth. And not only that, is that none of those organs have protectors. If someone makes a sound, I'll hear it, even if I didn't want to hear it. If someone does a dance right here, I'll see it. Even if I really didn't want to, I can look away, but I, but I saw it. There's no protector to the eyes in that sense, unless we want to close it or look away. Same thing with our nose. If there is a scent, there's an aroma of coffee, delicious coffee, so then that, that scent is inevitable. Talking, our mouth has two protectors. It has the teeth and the lips. Two fences that close the mouth from speaking. And the tongue is the only organ that sits there that needs to be picked up to, to become useful. It's an amazing thing. It's not a simple thing that we talk. We have extra protective measures, and we only have one mouth. We're supposed to talk half of what we listen. You can hear, listen, open your ears, two ears. We should be listening double what we speak. Okay. Now, Hanoke Mechavero, one who takes revenge of his fellow, over below Sase, violates a negative commandment in the Torah. What is a negative commandment? We said, distances us from the Almighty. Shenamar, as the verse states, lo sikom, you shall not take revenge. This is in Leviticus 19, 18. We learned this in our Parsha Review podcast. Those of you who are uh, interested, you can go listen. during. It's in Parsha's Kedoshim, I believe. You can find it on the interwebs. What is taking revenge that the Torah forbids? Amr Lachavero, one says to his friend, Hashileni Kardumcha, can you please lend me your axe? Omer Lo, Eini Mashilcha, he says, I'm sorry, I'm not lending it to you. Lamachar Hoya Chavero Tzarech Lishol, the next day, his fellow, the one who said no, comes to him and, and needs to borrow a different item from him. Omer Lo Chavero, Hashileni Kardumcha, and he says to him, lend me your axe, Amrlo, any mashilcha, kmoshaata lo hishaltani kashaalti nimcha. Just like I didn't, just like you didn't lend it to me, I'm not lending it to you. Harezin no kemva over belav. Such a person is someone who's taking revenge with his refusal to lend, and he has violated a negative commandment. That means you didn't do it to me. You didn't lend it to me, so I'm not going to lend it to you. Okay? Now, there's another prohibition of the Torah, which is very interesting. The Torah says you shouldn't have revenge, and it says, Lo titor, you should not bear a grudge. Allah is going to talk about it in a minute. You know what it means, Mark? Not to bear a grudge? So let me tell you, let me tell you. So I, I come to you and I say, uh, Mark, can I borrow your car? You're like, no. Okay, the next day you come to me and you say, oh, Rabbi, can I borrow your car? I'm like, no, you didn't lend me your car yesterday. I'm not lending you my car today. That's revenge. You know what a grudge is? A grudge is when you come to me and you ask and you say, Rabbi, can I borrow your car? I'm going to say, you know, Mark, I asked you yesterday if you would lend me your car. You said no. I'm not going to be like you. 
here, you can borrow my car because I'm not like you. That's holding a grudge. Torah says it's forbidden to do that. You know why? Because that hurts. You know what the Torah tells us about hurting another person? Don't do it. The Torah says don't hurt a fellow human being, particularly not with your words. We mentioned last week, you're not allowed to cause pain. You're not allowed to inflict pain upon another human being. Any type of pain. Rather, the proper way to respond when the second person comes to borrow an item, give it wholeheartedly. And don't treat him like he treated you. Rather, it is proper for a person to relinquish his measure of retribution with regard to anything related to this temporal world. Just let go. You don't always have to be in a position of, I'm in control and I'm going to dominate here because I'm going to teach you a lesson. There's a way the Torah wants us to live, which is higher. The Torah says, don't take revenge. Someone asked you, do the right thing. So it hurts you that they said no. Grow up. It's fine. They weren't able to. You know, I have a a rule with my wife that we together, you know, many times you'll hear people say, oh, you need a favor for them? They owe me a big favor. What does that mean, they owe you a big favor? We're counting favors here? I did them a kind deed. Now they owe me back a kind deed? That's not a kind deed. If your kind deed has a receipt with it, that now I'm going to claim my receipt for a favor in return, that's not a kind deed. There's a book that someone recommended I read. I'm not going to mention the name of the book. But it, it, but but it's 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 about networking and building up a rapport with people, and it's a whole a whole thing. And I didn't like the book because everything about that book is you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, and it's all a favor in return. That's not how we do kindness. We do kindness. I'll give you a thousand times, and I don't want one in return. And don't do me a favor in return because I did you a favor. So you owe me. You don't owe me. I'll give you an example. Many times with children in school, so you're running late at the doctor's office. You call a friend. You say, do you mind when you pick up your kid from school? Can you pick up my child as well? And, you know, bring home my child. I'll pick them up. I'll be there in 20 minutes. I just, you know, I don't want them to be, you know, stuck on the carpool line. Okay. So many times it's tempting. Someone call you and ask you for that favor once, twice, three times. And then we're in a situation. I remember this happened to us. And my wife's like, you know what? They, I picked up their kid a couple of times. I can call them and ask them. I said, no, I don't want that. I don't want a favor because we did a favor. Tit for tat. You know, I did you a favor. Now you do me a favor. No, I'll do a thousand favors and I don't want one in return. That's not why we do acts of kindness to build to build credit. It's not pol- we're not politicians here. We're human beings, we're servants of Hashem. We don't do it for the purpose of getting something in return. That's not pure kindness. Now, a person can have pure intentions and a person can do it for the right reason, and if he needs a favor in return, he needs a favor in return, but it's not because of that. It should not be linked. I threw out my receipts. It's zero, zero. And I do you another favor and it's still zero, zero. There's no score. And you don't owe me anything in return. And I don't want you to do it because I did it for you. Yitain Belev Shalom. With a wholeheartedness, a person should give, in, give, in, give it, even though this person may have harmed you or not given it to you when you wanted it. Plus, you never know what someone else is going through. You never know what someone is really experiencing. We think like, oh, what's the big deal? Well, you have money to lend me, right? Why, why can't you lend me money? Oh, he just he just doesn't want, right? And people come up with this whole story. I've heard so many people. I'm a rabbi, so I hear all the stories. People come to me all the time with these big, 
big uh, theories of why this person wasn't helpful to them and why that person wasn't and this and that. They have all these stories and all these theories. Maybe they just can't. There's a story in the Talmud that says that there was one of the great sages had a servant that worked for him for many years. And the servant was about to finish his career with this sage. And the servant says, okay, I'm about to go. It was right before Rosh Hashanah. And I'm going back to my family. Is it possible for you to maybe pay me for my services? So the sage says, I'm sorry, but I don't have any money. He says, okay, but what's about all of the fields? You know, you have, you have animals. I don't have them anymore. Guy's like, what? Right? That's what we would think, right? He says, what's about the fruits? You have so many fruits on the trees. You have so much. You know, don't have, he says, what's about linen, pillows, blankets? I can sell them. I can make the money. Don't have them anymore. What's about your animals? Nothing. So the guy goes on his way. The guy go, goes on his way. A few weeks later, the sage comes to this servant's house with chariots filled with goods. And he goes over to him and he says to him, when I told you that I didn't have any more money, what did you think? He says, well, we learned that we're supposed to judge favorably. So I figured you probably had invested it and you didn't have any liquid cash. Didn't have any more money. Didn't have any money to pay me. He says, that's right. He says, when I told you that I didn't have fields and I didn't have any more animals, he says, I figured you must have given him as a gift to the temple. He says, that's correct. That's exactly what happened. He says, and what happened when I said this and that? He's, he gives another theory of positive judgment on this sage. And the sage said, indeed. Everything you judged me favorably was actually true. He says, here's your money, and here's the reward for the positive judgment that you bestowed upon me. So I wanted to learn something from this. I had once an experience, I think I mentioned this a while back, a long time ago, when I was learning this exact topic of judging people favorably. You remember that story? So I was... 15 years old, 16 years old. I was in yeshiva and we were learning this topic, judging every person favorably. I said, you know what? You got to just come up with a story. Just like this guy came up with some Baba Misa and he, that's it. This is my story and I'm sticking with it. So I was once in the synagogue on Friday night and they're singing Lecha Dodi and I was, you know, standing over there on the side with my sitter on the shelf and walking back and forth and singing and humming with the, with the congregation. And I come back to my spot where I had my sitter on the shelf and someone walked off with my sitter. Like, what? That's a little odd. So I pull out a chumash. It was packed. The shul was packed. I pull out a chumash so I can look over, review the parsha, preparing for the parsha review podcast back, uh, you know, 30 years earlier. And, perhaps, and I put it down, and I'm humming again with the congregation, and we're singing L'cha Dodi, and I turn around for a second, and my chumash is gone. And I'm like, what is going on over here? I see the guy who walked off with my sitter, and the guy who walked off with my chumash, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make up a story. Maybe the story is right, maybe not. I'm just going to stick with it. I said, you know what? He's probably so confused. His wife just had a baby two minutes before Shabbos. He just got back. He's all all over the place. You know, he's he doesn't even know where he's at. And that's why he's just confused. And he took my sitter. Big deal. That's my story. And I'm sticking with it. Sure enough, after davening, the guy goes to the gabai of the shul. And he whispers something in his ear. And the gabai gives a big bang on the bima. He says, mazel tov, mazel tov. Just before Shabbos, his wife had a baby boy, and tonight he'll be hosting a Shalom Zachar, which is the custom at the first Shabbos of a baby boy. You have a special party Friday night, and he's going to be hosting something in his house. And no wonder, he didn't know what day of the week it was. He didn't know where he was. You know, he's just all over the place. And that's why, he, you know. So I learned from that story and many others since that you make up a story 
Hashem will succeed your way, that sometimes that, tr- that story will actually be true. And you'll merit to see, you know what? Just put a positive spin. You never know. As crazy as it may be, I had this recently. I don't remember what the story was, but I had it. One of the students in this class called me and said, you know, we spoke about judging people favorably and yada, yada, but, you know, come on, give me a break. Let me tell you the story, and you tell me if it's possible to even judge this person favorably. I said, you know, let's try. Let's try to figure it out together. He told me the story, and it was, re- it was, it was a difficult one. It wasn't a simple one. I said, but maybe there's something we don't know of the story. Maybe the reason he acted like that was because, you know, and we threw out some weird scenario. And it turned out to be true. And we were shocked in amazement that the story we made up was actually true, as crazy as it could be. The idea here behind all of this is that nobody is really evil and no one is wicked and no one is intending to harm you. And if someone is doing something that seems to be so terrible, there needs to be another part of the story that you don't know. I know I, all of you here are the nicest people, the most incredible people, the most gracious, kind people. Would anybody be mean and nasty just for the sake of being mean and nasty? No. There must be something going on. Oh, his wife yelled at him. He's concerned about uh, his uh, whatever. He has something on his mind. You never know what could be. You never know what could be. It's therefore very, very important for us to always keep it on the forefront of our mind. Judge every person favorably. Now, why am I mentioning judging favorably when we're talking about Lashon Hara? Because the only reason we speak Lashon Hara is because we're thinking the worst. We're thinking the worst of someone. If we don't think the worst and we think the positive about every person, we'll have nothing negative to say. So Hashem should bless us that we should succeed in that mission. Amen. For to those who, who really understand this world, everything in this world is vanity and worthless. And it is not worthwhile taking advantage for it. And so said King David, may peace be upon him. In Psalms chapter 7, verse 5, it says, Im gamalti sholmi ro vachalso. Let me be punished if I have ever repaid with evil those who treated me badly. I who rescued my tormentors gratuitously. So we see that King David wasn't always treated nicely. He still never took revenge and never let evil temptation or desire get the best of him. Of course, we know that the Torah says that you're not allowed to curse another person. Now, the halacha number eight over here says, If you wish to take proper revenge of your enemies, you should increase your good qualities and conduct yourself in a straightforward fashion. In this way, your revenge of your enemies will take place by itself. You know the best way to take revenge? Not by hurting them. You will never grow by knocking someone else down. You want to grow? You want to be bigger than them? Make yourself bigger. You be bigger. Work on your good character traits. Work on your good midos. For your elevated qualities will cause your enemy distress. And he will mourn when he hears of your good reputation. However, if you take revenge by perpetrating ugly deeds, then your enemy will rejoice over your degradation and your disgrace. Because now you're in the, in the mud with him. You're slinging mud with him. And he is thus taking revenge of, upon you. So what we see here is that the only way to grow is not by knocking another person down. 
You want to grow? Be bigger, be better. Be different by being better. There is there are so many examples we can give of people who were cheated out of their business, were cheated out of their inheritance, who were uh, cheated out of their jobs. And you can get into the mud and you can sling uh, mud at them and you can call them names and you can go around town and say, you know, this person is this and this person is that. Or you can do something different. Close your mouth, put your head down, and just become the best person you can become. And then you know what they have on you? They have nothing on you. You just pick, raise up your head and become greater. And that's what the halacha tells us to do. The halacha says if you're smart, you just become a better person. That is the greatest revenge you can possibly take. Because the idea at that point is that you don't really care about the revenge. You care about your own personal growth. And that's the key. And the final halacha says, Call Hanoter Le'echad Misrol, anyone who bears a grudge towards any Jew, violates a negative commandment, as the Torah tells us, you should not bear a grudge against the members of your people. Ketzer Hanetira, what is the bearing a grudge that the Torah forbade? Reuven Sha'amr Shimon. Reuven said to Shimon, Hashleini Dover Ploni, lend me such and such an item. Well, Aratza Shimon, and Shimon was not willing to lend. Sometime later, Shimon comes to borrow an item from Ruvain. And Ruvain says to him, Here it is. I will lend it to you. Because I'm not like you who would not lend it to me. I will not pay you back in accord with your actions. I'm not going to take revenge. I'm going to be better than you. And I'm going to give you, even though you didn't lend it to me. That's the example we gave earlier. Hose kaze over lo sitor. One who does this violates the prohibition in the Torah, you shall not bear a grudge. El yimcha hadover melibo. Rather than bear a grudge against one's fellow, it is proper for him to erase the matter from his heart. Lo yizkerena klau. And not to remember it at all. Erase it. It doesn't exist. Vizo he hadeya anachon, and this is the proper character trait. that can facilitate the existence of human society. Umasom umatonom shel bnei adam ze imze, and the interpersonal relationships of people. You want to know what's going to get this world to be a better place? The whole world talks about tikkun olam, repairing the world. You know what really repairs the world? Not fighting. Fighting doesn't do it. Oh, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to debate them. Never works. No one ever won a debate. Ever. No one ever won a debate. It's a fight. You know what wins? Just be better. Act in a kinder way. The Torah tells us how to act. It's an amazing thing because you think the Torah would be all about rules of do this, do that in, in very specific areas of business tells us how to conduct ourselves in, in marriage, in parenting. Torah tells us not to be jealous in the Big Ten, in the Big Ten Commandments. It tells us not to murder. Okay, these are obvious things, mostly. We learned that. We'll talk about that more a different time. But the Torah here tells us don't bear a grudge. Don't take revenge and don't bear a grudge. These are things that a person is trying to feel something that they're not. You're trying to be over another person. You're trying to be higher than another person. That's not the appropriate way for us to conduct ourselves. Torah reminds us time and again to remember that we aren't the God. Hashem is the God, creator of heaven and earth, and we need to subject ourselves to Hashem and only to Hashem. And any time we want to feel superior to another person, what we are in essence doing is saying, Hashem, you move aside. I need to step in now, and I need to play God here because I am in charge. It's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. That's why the Torah tells us, 
Lo sikom, lo sitor. Do not take revenge and do not bear a grudge because these are things that will distance you from Hashem. Hashem and an arrogant person cannot reside in one place. Ani vehu enon einenu yecholim ladu b'makom echad. Hashem hates the arrogant. Someone who has the feeling of superiority over another person is arrogant. That's why they want to bear a grudge. That's why they want to take revenge. But if they feel, hey, Hashem, you gave me an opportunity to do a mitzvah, and they see it only like that, that's the most important thing. So there's a lot of tit for that going on in the world today. There's a lot of you know, people trying to maneuver and get themselves into a position of superiority over other people. Say, just tell us, the Torah tells us, don't go there. Just be gracious. Just be kind. Be God-fearing. Ani Hashem. The verse ends, Ani Hashem, I am Hashem. Reminding us that Hashem knows, Hashem rewards. I want to tell you that when I was in my first Nonprofit volunteering job. I was 17 years old. I was in the former Soviet Union. And my mentor at the time told me, and we were, we were talking about it's, it's a difficult job. You are up till 3, 4, 5 in the morning. You're back up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And you're working 24 hours a day. And you're running after people and running after doing this and doing that and trying to get everyone together. And you're in a different language. You're speaking in a different language, right? So that's itself a difficult enough task. And I once said to him, I said, does anybody say thank you? Does anybody? That's right, spasiba. So he says to me, bring me a sitter. I want to read you this that we say every Shabbos in our prayer. Right before Musaf, we say a very, very special prayer. We say, v'chol mi sh'ozki mitzorche tzibur be'emunah. And all who are involved in the needs of the community with integrity, may the Holy One, blessed is He, pay their reward and remove from them every affliction, heal their, their entire body and forgive their every iniquity, and send blessing and success to all their handiwork, along with all Israel, their brethren, and let us say, Amen. Okay? So he says to me, I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. He says, and all who are involved in the needs of the community with integrity, may Hashem repay them? What do you mean? The community should recognize. The community should see. We should have a plaque on the wall that says, oh, in honor of Lauren, who's such a great volunteer for, a con- for his congregation, he's a member on the board, and he's, he donates, and he's committed, and he gives of his time. He says, why does it have to be Hashem? Why is Hashem the one who's going to pay the reward. He says, because only Hashem knows how much work you put in. Only Hashem knows the dedication, the commitment, the thought, the tears, the sweat that goes into your hard work. You know, Hashem pays it back. We don't need to do it for other people to recognize. There's only one being that we need to be concerned about, and that's the Almighty. Your neighbors are never going to realize they're never going to appreciate everything you do. They are never going to acknowledge the extent of your greatness, of your volunteership, of your commitment and dedication for the community. People should recognize. People should acknowledge. What's the big deal? They can't say, thank you, Marion, for everything you've done? Guess what? Nobody knows the extent of your commitment except for Hashem. So when we're trying to be a little guy, trying to clamor for a little bit more recognition, I'm going to take revenge so that you know who's boss. What are we doing? We're being little people. We can be so great and so big. We can be so much closer to God. Be God-like. And realize that Hashem sees everything. And Hashem smiles. I recently had a very interesting situation. There was a program that my wife and I worked very, very hard to establish. And there were some changes that were needed in that program. And there were people who 
said they want to get involved in helping with that with that specific project. And I said, no problem. You have full autonomy to do whatever you need to do, but on one condition, that it stays under the same umbrella. Otherwise, you have full autonomy. It stays under the same umbrella. We can keep a unity. And sure enough, a couple months go by, and what's the agreement? Keep the unity, right? Yes, yeah, so that that's not going to happen. You know, they come and they say, thank you very much, but we decided we're going to take your project and we're going to make it our own now. We're going to do something else with it. Okay, so recently they had a celebration. That entity had a celebration. And my wife and I were there. And it's funny that many people came over to me and they said, we remember the hard work you put into it, to getting it started. Nobody here recognizes, nobody here acknowledges, but we do. And we appreciate it. Thank you. And I told my wife, my wife came to me, she says, how do you feel being here at this event? I said, I actually feel great. It's taken some time, but I feel great. I'll tell you why. I said, I feel great because our job is only for Hashem to be happy with what we do. I don't care about what people think. If Hashem is happy, then I know I did my, my job right. But if people don't recognize, so they don't recognize. Who cares? We're doing it for people. We're doing it for people to say, oh, Walby, good job. No, we're doing it so that Hashem says we come up to heaven. Hopefully he'll say, you know, that entire project, all the good things that they've ever done is all because of you, because you put in that hard work, because you put in that effort. They robbed it from you. Great. Now you get it for free. Now it's interest free. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to fundraise for it. You don't have to take care of anything. They're doing the work for you. Thank them. Support them. Because imagine if you come to heaven and they have this whole palace built. You're like, what's this palace? They're like, oh, that's the project you started that they stole from you? Yeah, that's all you. You get the credit for that. Imagine. I told my wife, I said, it, it, it maybe pinches a little bit. But you know what? Let's look at the big picture. The big picture is Hashem happy. And if Hashem is happy, we have nothing in the world to feel bad about. We have nothing in the world. So the neighbors don't acknowledge, big deal. No, nobody knows. Nobody knows all the hard work that, it's fine. Nobody needs to know. We don't do it for everybody else. We do it for the right reason. We do it for the right reason. We have nothing to, to worry about. So you had a question. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. How do I know if Hashem is happy with me? How do I know? So we have to communicate with Hashem and talk to Hashem. And see, look out for the kiss from Hashem. Hashem communicates with us all the time. And if you think he doesn't, you're not listening. I was in Israel and I, I, I had spent 10 days with my rabbi on a special exclusive trip. It was such a special week that we spent with him. And right when he started, he said, you know, many people have this question of like, how do I know there's a God? I can't see him. He says, you can't see God? Who can't see God? God is everywhere. He's talking to you every single day. How can you not see God? God is everywhere. So we need to talk to God. And that's exactly the idea. We open up our prayer book every day and we talk to Hashem. I will tell you, just two weeks ago, I, I had a very intense conversation with God. Where in my prayers, I was talking to Hashem and saying, Hashem, no, no, this is not, no, we, we, we got to talk about this, okay? And we're having this conversation, and I'm like, Hashem, you got to show me the light here. I'm dealing with an issue. I need you to show me a sign. And if I tell you that like a lightning bolt, Hashem showed me that sign. Hashem talks to us all the time. We have to make ourselves a vessel worthy of hearing that message. But Hashem talks to us, and Hashem communicates. And you know what? You see success in the things that you do. That's Hashem smiling at you and saying, I like what you're doing. Now, a person needs to make sure that he's doing the right thing because there are powers in this world. There's the powers of good and there's the powers of evil. And sometimes the powers of evil have the ability to succeed your way as well so that you continue doing. For example, if someone goes to the casinos and makes all this money so that he can give it to charity. 
That's not kosher money. The Torah says not to do it. The Torah says not to earn money like that. So you're doing all these acts of kindness. You're giving money to your synagogue. You're giving money to your shul, right? To your school, to all of those institutions. It's not clean money. That's the dark side taking power over our Torah institutions, perhaps. Be so careful about it that it should be clean and not allow it to have any hint of something which is impure. But Hashem communicates with us in very, very clear language. We just have to be ready to hear it. I'll give you an, an example. My daughter and I, we used to drive to school, I used to teach in her school, and we used to drive every morning when I would, I would take her to school. And being on time or not being on time was dependent on the lights. If the lights all turned green at the right time, we would make it on time for school. If not, we'd be a minute or two late. But then if you're late, it counts on your score, and it's okay. So I once said to her, why don't you daven? Talk to Hashem and ask Him to give you the green lights. So she did, and every light turned green. Now, a person can say, well, no, that's just a coincidence. Well, if you want to live in a world of oblivion, that's fine. If you want to live in a world where Hashem is communicating with you, you can see the answers. Now, the answer is not always going to be a green light. Sometimes the answer is going to be a red light. But Hashem is still communicating. And He's communicating very clearly with us. We just have to be receptacles that are capable of absorbing those messages. All right, my dear friends, have a terrific evening. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com.